that definitely sparked so much more within me as well in terms of my own self-expression and coming into my own identity. It like cracked me open and really allowed me to continue to ask myself the questions of like, what do I want? Which then was able to lead me to leaving teaching and starting my own business and becoming a personal stylist and be able to facilitate these questions and conversations for other people. Some people have never even thought about it or they haven't asked themselves since they were a kid, you know, like, who am I outside of the roles that I have in my life? Hey gang, this week's episode with Susan Padrone is one that you do not want to miss. She's an intuitive stylist who was a former band teacher and has come full circle really being able to find who she really is through her sense of style and offering that gift to others to help them do the same. As somebody who is actively struggling to find my own style, it is something that just I, it really opened my eyes to what I need to consider when I'm going to not just buy clothes, but when I accessorize and the way that I think about myself as I'm going through that process. It's not just about shopping and finding the right thing to wear. It's about understanding yourself well enough to find the things that fit your personality, your vibe, your energy, who you are and what you present to the world. So I hope that you really enjoy this episode. It was fun, dynamic, and just overall really informative about how we might approach how we look moving forward. So, oh God, I'm so glad we're chatting again. I really enjoyed our first conversation. Likewise. The thing that I loved so much when you and I first spoke, Susan, was how obvious it is that like you are comfortable with who you are and that you. you radiate something that I feel provides an instant comfort in speaking with you. Thank you so much. That really means everything to me because it's something that I really strive for and something that I've worked really hard on like getting to this point for myself. And I think that my own personal journey really was happening alongside with my development of my personal styling career because I knew what I was facilitating for so many clients. And I kind of had to make sure that I was, you know, like putting my money where my mouth was, you know, like I couldn't just be like, I'm going to teach you how to be confident and like really channel who you are on the inside. If I didn't know who that was for me, you know, like, because you can't, (laughs) you can't do that for other people if you're not secure with yourself. So there's a lot that I had to unpack for myself, you know, like just in terms of body issues and like, confidence and identifying within my own right and really sorting through like, what do I want from my life? Yeah. You know, just me like sitting by myself in a room with no one else saying, you know, like what, what do I want? Who am I without anyone else's opinions? Ooh, that's a hard one to answer though. Right. Cause it requires a lot. It requires a lot. I actually feel like I've been in, um, a bit of a I love to confront myself. I love the introspection, but there are moments and I've been in one for the last couple of weeks where I'm like, I got to sit with it. I know I do. Right. I know. And so it's like very easy to avoid because we can distract with a variety of other things and we can distract with things that we feel are helping us. Like we can over commit to like learning new things or or tasking ourselves (laughs) with something. And so The fact that you mentioned like really sitting there and being in the quiet and finding the space for yourself, making the space for yourself, and then being very intentional about like, let what feels right come to you. It Mm. is so much more simply described than it is executed. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Because you have to sit with that discomfort, you know, because there (laughs) is, I think, a bit of discomfort that naturally comes with like sitting in the quiet and the stillness. And I completely understand what you're saying about, you know, wanting to distract yourself from like do it and do other things and learn more. I was literally just having this conversation with a friend yesterday and she was saying how she's kind of forcing herself to be in that quiet and just process things that are coming up for her. And she's like, but 
I want to do things. Like I don't want to just sit and process. Like I want to do. And the do becomes so much of a distraction and just, yeah. you know, kind of takes our energy and turns it towards something else rather than allowing ourselves to just examine what we've already done and what's in front of us and what's behind us, what's coming forward for us in the future too. Yeah. There's just so much to it. And it can yeah, be a well, lot. <laughs> I love that you said that too. And and it's obviously super um, relevant to the conversation too, because a big part of what you do is speaking to the intuitive part of who we are and like what you just said, like what's coming forth. I really love the way that you mm -hmm. stated that because even just last night, um, Nicole and I were having this conversation about how I was feeling a little panicked about something and she was in such a good place energetically. And she's like, no, but it's all about like the energy that we put into it. And if you want this to be your life over here, like we need to build, a, build the foundation for it. But mm -hmm. when we're distracting ourselves with other things, we're basically like at the old house, pulling weeds and trimming shrubs instead of laying the foundation for the thing that we want. You're never mm -hmm. going to have this new thing that you desire if you're always over here focusing on the thing that is comfortable, safe, distracting to you, right? Now, sometimes yeah. that can manifest as um, like productive procrastination. The house gets cleaned, mm -hmm. the lawn gets mowed, great things are done now. But I'm no right. further along in my journey of what really feels aligned and right to me because I've been sitting here sort of dilly dallying in the garden rather than being like, well, what's the plan to like move to this different stage of life? Yeah, absolutely. I see that with, you know, my clients too. And, you know, like bringing it from a, a clothing and a style perspective, it's like sticking with what's comfortable, you know, what they already know and buying more of that or just recreating what hasn't been working for them, but they have this certain comfort level within it. And they're like, this, oh, yeah. this isn't working and I don't know why. And it's like, well, it's not working because you're, you're doing the same thing and expecting different results. Thinking about it with your with your clothing is so important. Mm -hmm. I This is constant for me. We were just saying yesterday, I want like a modular uh, like sort of style where I can pick and choose the things that I know will go. But what yeah. I've done is create a closet full of stuff that I mostly don't like um, mm -hmm. or won't wear again. And then I have like my five go-to outfits depending on the season. Yeah. But I don't feel like any of those things, particularly maybe like a little bit, are like a sense of style or reflection of my personality as much as they are what I can find that I feel comfortable in from a fit perspective. But that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean it's comfortable for me on like a visceral level. Yeah. So I wonder what it is about the fit that makes you feel a certain level of comfort with it, mm. but then where also where the disconnect is that it's not resonating with who you are. Like, what is it? How can we kind of unpack that and break that apart a little bit? Oh, I like that question. And I'm so glad that we're doing this. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I actually, so this is interesting because I, I would say most of my life, like, so we were talking earlier about being in high school and I was playing sports. Well, it was sort of like you wear your sweats, you like have your gear or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you wear whatever's trendy, but I was never like a trendy person. Once in a blue moon, I'd buy something that everybody else had because I felt like I should, but then it never felt right. Um, yeah. Then I like went through this really like queer looking phase in college where I was like cargo shorts, rugby shirts, hats. Um, <laughs> some of those things have stayed, hats for sure. <laughs> But I think that I, that was also like I had weight on at the time and I was kind of trying to hide that. And then I feel like in the last couple of years, I definitely appreciate like certain things like joggers with t-shirts or like certain button downs. But my issue, Susan, is that because I dress and I prefer to dress, what I feel the most comfortable in is more androgynous. Mm -hmm. I don't want to wear a crop top. I don't want to wear something that's super tight. I feel really... Yeah out of my element in something like that, it's never going to suit me. So then I end up being like, okay, well, what's unisex or possibly small enough in a men's fit that will, that will fit me. But again, like men's clothing is very differently tailored than women's. And I have, yes. um, I have, 
I have enough up top that like a men's shirt isn't always going to work for me. And so right. like, I think a big part of why I end up getting the same things, even if it's not like the thing that I like the most is because I know that the style fits me well enough and that it's generally speaking something that I can sort of repeat wear and, and just know that it's like a good go-to. But I'm mm -hmm. super insecure about shopping because I hate feeling like I have to shop in the men's section when I don't, I, I'm not masculine, like as a, as a, an energy mm -hmm. as a person. It's just my look is more androgynous. So the women's section is virtually useless to me in a lot of cases. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. And I've heard that quite a bit from clients or in similar situations where they just feel like neither option is really the <laughs> ideal. Like the men's section is not cut appropriately. The women's section is also not cut appropriately for, you know, how you want to highlight your body. And then you're left just feeling frustrated and defeated, which can just be a lot. And it's, it's tough. And I'm sorry that, you know, you experience that. It definitely like plays into this anxiety that I have that I'm like very clear on where it comes from being a child and being bullied and being told I looked like a boy. I only cut mm -hmm. my hair really recently in the last couple of years and to the point where it was short enough, somebody might mistake me for a guy from behind, which has happened. And um, it used to bother me a lot. And then the um, the last time it happened, I was literally a couple of weeks ago, I was on a plane and the guy made a comment, excuse me, sir. And then looked at me, he's like, ma'am, because it's like, as soon as I turn around, like you're like, it feels like they're immediately aware. Right. But right. there's, there's been this massive insecurity for me being in like, let's say like, I'm just going to use a Marshall's as an example where the men's yeah. and women's sections are sort of right near each other. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm in there and I'm like, okay, well I'll browse the women's section. Don't find anything, but I'm more likely go right to the men's section because I know that if I'm looking for a t-shirt or something really basic, yeah. like that's probably where I'll go. The anxiety mm -hmm. that I get as a female feeling like I need to shop in the men's section and then having the sense of what is somebody else thinking of me because I'm shopping here. I know rationally that it doesn't matter, but it yeah. like plays into insecurities that I have. And then it also makes it harder for me to shop because I'm not comfortable. I'm not in like a state of calm yeah. and fun and flow. I'm anxious being like, find something and get out of here. Yeah. I understand that. I mean, there's a lot of pressure that I think it's naturally placed upon us or that we place upon ourselves when we're shopping. You know, when we're shopping in public and in stores, there's just so much pressure that arises, whether you feel pressure from the people who work at the store or people that are mm -hmm. shopping along with you, or even just for yourself. Like we have these expectations of what success or what a successful shopping trip looks like and what clothing we should be picking out or what we should be wearing, you know, whether it's certain trends or certain styles. And that's one of the reasons why I would love to put you on the spot, Nikki, and ask you, you know, clothing aside, okay, we're just going to forget clothes for a quick second. We're just going to like put that on pause. And I want you to just describe yourself. And not the roles that you have in your life, just who you are as the unique, wonderful individual that you are. The first word that comes to mind is playful. Friendly. I also would say, I joke around with people verbose, uh, which is true. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, you know, I um, kind, compassionate, intentional, introspective. Mm. And yeah, I'd say those are, those are the ones that come to mind first. I can keep going if I yeah. need to oh, <laughs> rattle I off that. more. I love everything that you shared. And the reason that I you know wanted to just kind of jump in and ask you that question is because that's where we can start to kind of see where we would come up within our clothes. So, you know, the first word that you said was playful, right? And when, you know, I see you now, you are dressed like head to toe in all black. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when we're talking about clothes and how it connects to who we are, colors and patterns and styles, all of that has its, its own language that it communicates visually to other people when we have our own interactions with other people. That's, you know, we're speaking to them before we even open our mouths. 
And when yeah. I see, you know, you in all black and the first word that comes to that comes out of your mouth is playful, which I love, I'm like, oh no, like <laughs> that playfulness yeah. outside of you, like is not being reflected at all. I mean, all black is fun and it serves its place. I know in some industries it's a requirement. I get it. But when you identify first as playful. That tells me like I should see you in like fun patterns and brighter colors. And the fact that you also mentioned that you were kind like that and introspective, that to me speaks to more like softer fabrics and materials too. Yeah. Where And we can combine all of that so that whether you're communicating directly, like the playfulness, I think is usually more of like an outward visual expression where that can come out and people can see that right away. But the more, more of the words that you use to describe yourself that were more like for you, that's where we can connect it to fabrics, you know, and how things feel on your body so that you feel safe and connected with the clothes that you're wearing and connecting that back to yourself. Yeah. Well, I love that um, exercise so much and I have a lot of thoughts around it. So one of the things that I will say um, with regard to, I <laughs> like as soon as you said, I was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely black. I have red pants on or like, um, they're like maroon pants. Ooh. So there's, there's a, there's okay. a pop of color happening today, I love it. but you know, <laughs> the, the thing is, um, I also, I'll be, I'll be real. This is, it's, I'm like, this part of me is like, I'm embarrassed to say it out loud, but it's a fact of reality is like, I am a sweater. So the other thing is, is finding clothes that I don't feel like I'm, that are immediately obvious if I'm, if I'm perspiring. (laughs) And so black ends up being sort of the the thing or a material that is sort of more resistant. So that one is, is challenging to me and does dictate, I would say a lot of what clothing that I choose. Yeah. The other thing is that When it comes to being playful, the thing that I was considering as you were saying that is I do like to have like funky glasses. Love that. And my hairstyle generally, I would say, is something that like, of course, I'm wearing a hat right now. (laughs) Representative sort of where my style shows is like in my glasses and in my hair. I had done a really drastic cut and color after losing my mom. And it was like aggressive, this insanely bright red because it was her favorite color. And Mm -hmm. I felt like, you know, the color was absurd, but fun. And as it was like fading, it was going into this like rose gold and blonde. And I really enjoyed it Mm -hmm. because I never dye my hair. So it was like a really cool experience for me to have. Yeah. I like being able to express myself through my hair because it does a lot of things. So it's basically like if I desire for it to do something, it will do that. It's very malleable. And so I feel like over the years, if I go back and I look at where the like most obvious points of my personality represented through my look happen, it's literally through my hair. And I'd never really considered that until now. <laughs> I love that. Hooray for like major life realizations happening in real time. I think that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, I love it. It's like <laughs> therapy. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, hair, I think a lot of people have certain ideas around hair. And personally for me, I love to think of hair as an accessory, right? Like where it's something that we can really play around with and use that as just an ever-changing, ever-evolving form of self-expression too. And it is connected to our style, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I am I had my hair super short for a very long time and it was a very dramatic cut when I went short and I loved it. Um, and then I just kept going shorter and shorter and hit my limit, couldn't do it anymore. So I was like, well, I guess now I have to grow it out. So that's the phase that I'm in right now, but I'm still trying to change it up. I'm so nervous about the grow out. <laughs> I'm so nervous about the grow out when that moment comes. I know. It's like, it's a little bit of a bummer, but thankfully I have a great hairstylist and she, she knows how I like crave change. I'm like, we cannot be boring with this. Like I can't, I can't just do like varying phases of a bob haircut. Like I would lose my mind because I wouldn't feel like myself. Yeah. And so many people are so afraid of changing their look with their hair because it feels like such a big commitment. And in some ways it is, but in other ways, like how is it any different from changing your clothes, changing your style? It's just an extension of it. Yeah. 
And I really love that that's something that you feel connected to and how that's a way that you're able to have that form of self-expression, you know, with your glasses and with your hair. And I hear you on struggling with being a sweater. I am a sweater as well. And it is rough. Holy cow. Like the older I get, I'm like, why, why are we doing this? Like, Sweating yeah. is brutal and miserable <laughs> and uh, not a fan. Um, but Thank you for relating. Yeah. I feel like it's one of those things. It's like you can see it, but we never want to really talk about it. But the reality yeah. is, is that it, it affects what I wear. It affects a lot of yeah. what I choose or don't choose. There are some people that can be like, I sweat and I'm comfortable, whatever, if it's showing. For me, I get very insecure. Same. I do too. Especially since clothing... <laughs> self-expression's my job. Like I have to look, you know, put together. People kind of expect that from me. Yeah. I expect that from me. And when I feel like I'm visibly sweaty, I'm like, this isn't cute anymore. Like yeah. I just yeah. shave my head and like, give me a towel. I don't even know. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's tough to kind of navigate that, especially with clothing and especially with certain fabrics, you know, making sure that whether it's like having the right undergarments or like having the right kind of products to help reduce the visible sweating. Um, Or even like, you you know, how you were saying how darker clothes and certain fabrics are usually your preferred way of dealing with that. You know, also with how certain armholes are cut, like the sleeve holes on shirts too, if they're like a little bit looser fitting and that's ideal because they're not going to be all up in that space getting sweaty and miserable. Um, but yeah, it's a tough one to navigate for sure. Especially when we're thinking, I mean, we do have to think about how our style engages with our lifestyle, with our, like the practicality Mm. of our our lives. Because if we don't, you're not going to want to wear those clothes because you're like, oh, well, can't wear that. It's going to be a hot one today. Like I'd love to wear it. It's a perfect summer top, but if I wear it, then I'm going to be a sweaty mess and I'm going to be really uncomfortable and miserable about it. Yeah. So you got to choose what works and what works for you too. And I really appreciate that. And I feel like this is like, this needs to be something that I clip out because I want to speak to all the other fellow sweaty people out there who are choosing their outfits (laughs) based on what does or does not show sweat. Yeah. The plight is real. (laughs) Yeah. The struggle is real. I don't think I've ever spoken, um, publicly about being a sweater in this way, but you know, I'm here for it. And I like, I, preach about vulnerability. So why not? Why not be open about it? I mean, I tell my clients because inevitably like they see me sweating because real life, but like, you know, to just let people know that, you know, wearing all black is a temporary solution. And if that's your vibe, great. But for someone like me, <laughs> for someone like you, Nikki, you know, it's not, it's more just a, a band aid on this issue. Yeah. And I love how you're finding other ways to kind of bring it in. And I encourage other people to do the same thing with like bringing in, you know, a cool pair of glasses, if you like you or your hair, or, you know, for me, I'm like, well, tattoos are like my constant way of showing yeah. my personality, regardless of what I'm wearing or jewelry. Like there are so many different things that we can bring in to an outfit no matter what the clothes look like, or we can still have those little like glimmers of our personality of who we are as that unique person while still being comfortable with what we're wearing too. Yeah. Well, I love that. And I feel like to your point, um, accessorizing, I think is a really great way to also, um, give you variety without having to feel like you need to make a ton of choices about like what clothing you need to to buy. For and sure. I think having like time, timeless pieces is um, helpful. Yeah. I'm a big fan of like a plain t-shirt. Yeah. When it's fitted right, it feels good to wear it and it goes with everything. Definitely. And even to the point where, because like I actually recently, um, well, I guess not recently now, it was like a couple of years ago, my friend got married and it was the first time that I was going to a wedding since having chopped my hair off. And I was like, I'm not going to feel comfortable in a dress. Mm -hmm. This was the first time that I was wearing. uh, I decided I asked my friends, I was like, would you be okay? You know, if I if I wear like a 
tux to your wedding? And she was like, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like wear whatever you're comfortable in. And yeah. um, because it was black tie, it was a very formal Ooh. event. And so I was wow. like, okay, um, I want to go and I want to feel comfortable and look my best. I ended up thinking, I think I got this really nice suit at like White House Black Market. Um, so it was, it was, it, it was a black uh, women's tux with like, um, the lining was really cute. It had like a little pattern. This is the other thing I like about stuff like that. I really, I just need somebody to just build, build a brand around what I desire. Um, and maybe it's me. I don't know if I have that, what it, what it takes, but I'd at least like to be the inspiration for it. And so I was like yeah. really comfortable. I got to accent with like a fun, like blue tie and I had like blue Oxfords. And so it was like, there was, this opportunity to the point to like accessorize and feel comfortable in the way that I was, whereas like any wedding before that, I would have absolutely been in a dress because I would have thought that's what you're supposed to do. That's how I have to dress. And it was never, I don't prefer wearing dresses, but I'm fine wearing a dress, you know? Yeah. I got to a place where I was like, if I wear this with my hair like this and I feel like it's not in congruence with who I am now, I'm sort of like abandoning myself for the sake of what I think other people expect of me. And in reality, mm. it was the most validating experience that I could have had because everybody at the wedding was telling me how great I looked. And I was like, well, it's because I'm comfortable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I'm sure you are just radiating confidence too the whole time. Like, and that's, I think some of the most beautiful things about styles that when we find something that feels so good and feels aligned with who we are, it's just like this beam of light that just glows from your entire body. And I tell people that all the time because so many people get caught up in like, oh my gosh, well, what are people going to say? What are they going to think? Like, and they get nervous about trying things that they really want. And I tell them like, look, when you wear things that make you feel so good, that like beam of light that you're radiating, it makes you like untouchable in from the, away from all of the negativity, all the criticism. It's like this beautiful, just protective bubble that keeps all the bad stuff out and welcomes in all of the compliments because the compliments just flow like your experience at that wedding. It's like, you're just like, Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> like, yes, I love this. Yes. I love this thing. Like I feel good. You think I look good. I love this. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. I love the idea that com- a compliment is, is just flow. It's so good. I was actually looking this up, um, yesterday or the day before, because I had done this previously and I, it was basically like, how to receive a compliment. And I was re-looking this up. I I had done this a couple of years ago and it fundamentally changed my perspective on how to accept compliments because it's Mm -hmm. so hard for so many of us because we're so uncomfortable with people acknowledging things within ourselves that like we either, you know, thank and compliment back because we feel like we need to reciprocate or we downplay it and minimize it. It's like, it wasn't that big of a deal or we deflect Mm -hmm. and we basically say like, no, that's not true. Or we, you know, whatever it is. And it's like, so we have these mechanisms that are basically like when somebody wants to give us this compliment, we, our instinct is to not fully allow it. And I think that when you are comfortable and you're confident, like you're describing, and you have this sense of, I know I look good, not being arrogant, just like, I feel comfortable. I feel confident. I'm in my own vibe. And other people recognize that, man, it makes it so much easier to accept the compliment because you're like, yes, I do. Yes, I am. Thank you. Right. It's just, you can, you can fully embrace what you're receiving. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yes. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I remember <laughs> this Amy Schumer skit that was came out, I don't even know how many years ago now, but it was about how women specifically deal with compliments. Um, I forget what the name of the skit is. It might just be compliments or something. And of course, it's Amy Schumer. It's like, it's comedy. It's supposed to be like very over the top. But that was one of the most eye-opening moments for me because it really spoke to the, obviously, like the ridiculousness of the, (laughs) just um, like how women specifically deflect and refuse to accept a compliment. Yeah. 
And of course, the like the skit just gets more and more absurd. But it really opened my eyes. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, we do these things. Like not to this degree, but yeah, we do have to justify it. Or we do have to say like, you know, we have to downplay it or we can't receive it. And I see that again with my clients too. And something that I just tell them is if they're really, really uncomfortable with receiving a compliment, I tell them just to say thank you and stop and just practice saying thank you and just let yourself stop. Yes. And eventually it becomes easier to really like hear and process and receive the compliment, but just letting that space be there for the compliment to kind of uh, penetrate yourself, your aura and like feel and feel it rather than being like, Oh, this, like I've had it forever. Or, you know, like "Mm, this, Oh my gosh, well, it's only like, I paid so little for it and it's so comfortable. You know, I just thought I'd throw it like, no, thank you. If you want to make a conversation about it, great, like do it, but it doesn't have to be at the, you know, at the sake of putting down the compliment. Yeah. Oh, I love it. And you're absolutely right. So when I did this exercise a couple of years ago and I looked this up and again, I like can't even remember what sparked it, but for some reason I was just like, how do I accept it or get better at accepting compliments? And it, w- it was very much that if nothing else, just say, thank you. You don't have yeah. to, it's sort of the way we feel we have to explain when we say no to something like, you mm. don't just no. And thank you. They're, they're complete sentences. They're, they're, that can be it. That can be your response. Exactly. I feel like what you're doing is so important and it's something that we don't think enough about in the way that will help us feel more confident, feel better. Like we we spend probably too much time considering what am I wearing? How will people think about what I'm wearing? How do I feel or think about what I'm wearing? Yeah. Instead of, you know, tending to the feeling that we want to have And then kind of working backwards from that and being like, what is it that will help me feel this way? And you had mentioned, you know, on your own journey, kind of coming to this place and this recognition. I know you had been um, a middle school, I think, band teacher prior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, middle school band teacher. And you have a son and you were struggling a bit with like, okay, outside of being a mom and being a teacher, you know, like, who, who is Susan? And I think a lot of us go to this place of, you know, you asked me, you're like, describe yourself, but don't say the things that you do, say things that you feel about yourself. So what was it for you once you sort of quieted things down and, um, you know, gave yourself the space to explore that? Like what started coming up for you that ended up like veering you in this direction where you could help people navigate this? Because it is a really unique um, skill set that I would like to see more people people empowered to harness. Thank you. I really appreciate you saying all of that. I think for me, uh, what really came up was <laughs> that um, I'm a lot stronger than I ever gave myself credit for. And growing up, I was always really shy and quiet. And I saw those things as negative attributes where, you know, my other people in my life that were close to me, they were friendly, they could talk to anybody, they would just be able to jump in and harness a conversation regardless of the, you know, the atmosphere or wherever we were. And that never felt like me, you know, and I always felt like, oh, you know, uh, the other people in my life, the other like family members, like they're the, you know, the really friendly, like outgoing ones. And Susan's the quiet one. Susan's the shy, quiet one. And maybe that was something that I just kind of heard and then decided to embrace rather than it being said so many times, maybe, you know, as kids and as grow, you know, young adults, we tend to just hear something and then it lingers for whatever reason. Yeah. But when I was teaching, um, you know, I had to find my voice, obviously, like dealing with middle schoolers is no joke. Um, <laughs> and I loved it. I wouldn't choose it, Susan. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, you can't scare me. Like I taught middle school, like not to be all cliche, but I'm like, I taught middle school for seven years. I willingly gave them 
noisemakers and then stayed in the room and like fostered that love of their noisemakers. Like I, not, you can't scare me. Like I don't judge people and I'm not easily frightened. But anyway, that, that aside. <laughs> so standing up in front of, you know, the classroom and, you know, performing concerts and all of those things, I started to kind of find my own voice. But when I had my son and I took some time off from teaching and I knew that I had to go back to teaching because my husband lost his job at the time, I was at this point in my life where I really was able to realize that I did not love teaching as much as I thought I did. Um, And it wasn't about the kids and it wasn't about music. It was about everything else, you know, in public education. It's tough. It's not for everybody. It was not for me. And I was able to realize that not only was I finding my voice and that I was stronger than I thought (laughs) I was, um, but I was a little bit more rebellious than I thought too. And um, it turns out that most administrators in public education don't really love that from a teacher, (laughs) Uh, which is fine. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to completely change careers. I'm going to start my own business, despite the fact that, again, like my husband was currently like trying to build his own business after becoming unemployed. Like it was not a great time. We had a baby, but I knew my intuition, my spirit guides, like everybody was like, you need to do this. Everyone in my family was like, what are you doing? <laughs> this is terrifying. <laughs> yeah, that does. sounds right. <laughs> because, you know, it's it's your family's job to be worried for you, to love you, all of those things. And that was definitely what I was receiving. But I, that rebellious side, that like a little bit, I was like, mm, but we need this. Like Susan needs this. And I knew in order to be like the best me, you know, the best mom, the best wife, the best me, I needed to pursue something else. And it took me a little while to figure out what that was going to be. And thankfully I had a friend that shared with me how much she loved the fact that I would help her pick out clothes. And that was when I was finally able to like give myself that permission to pursue becoming a stylist because it just wasn't on my radar you know, I was so convinced that this shy person, you know, that was just going to follow my timeline that I had planned out for myself, you know, like I went to college, I got my degree, I got my job, like I got married, I had a kid, I had a dog, like a house, all the things like check, 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 you know, all of my timeline. And then it was like this hard stop where I was like, oh, but I'm not happy. I'm yeah. not happy. Yeah, that one will kick up. you in the pants. Oh my gosh. So hard. Like, and it was the kick in the pants that I needed because I it like really just it was like the universe like took me by the shoulders and just kind of like shook me and was like, this is not who you are. And <laughs> when I sat with that stillness and that quiet, it's like, yeah, you know, I've been turning my own volume down for as long as I can remember and dimming my light (laughs) for as long as I can remember. And there were these moments, like these little moments that kind of happened along the way where it was like getting my, my tattoo. It wasn't my first tattoo, but it was my first tattoo in a more like this professionally visible place. I feel like that's, you know, Oh yeah. I had that moment too, where I was like, screw it. I don't care if you don't want me to have tattoos because it doesn't change my ability to do my work. So you can take it or leave it. I had that moment. (laughs) Exactly. And that was so freeing for me. Like I, at that point I had like four tattoos already, but they were all like easily covered by, you know, quote unquote professional clothing. And then I got a tattoo on like my inner bicep. And this is like, I know it's like nothing now because but this is, you know, like, oh gosh, like eight years ago. I think that's close to the same timing when I did, I did the same thing. I did inner bicep and I did across both biceps and I was in a professional (laughs) setting where it was like, I was like, I don't care. 
like I'm doing it yeah. because this is what's right for me. So sorry, I you're in public education. That's obviously different as well. But there's that lim- there's that expectation that you're not going to have your own self expression appear yes. while you're in your professional life. And I feel like that's such right. a big part of the problem is that like you can't express yourself fully. You have to fall in line. That's the whole issue I've taken with like working business casual, like or or business professional in like the clothing that you're wearing. If you do not have to be meeting with people in professional situations where that's required, why are you requiring that of me to sit in an office at a computer? It's like that to me is a mechanism of control and like yep. oppression of your self-expression. Sorry to like dive no. in and, and sort of interject that, but it like really clearly sparked something with me um, and I totally get it. I mean, I yes, and I completely agree. It does really come down to control. And I think that there's... I mean, we can go down like a totally different rabbit hole with the idea of, you know, professional, quote unquote, professional dress code and the root of all of that and the sexism and racism that all plays in there. But I feel like that's a deeper conversation for another time. But that was. I'm happy to have it. (laughs) (laughs) I would love that. Um, But my tattoo, my first like more visible tattoo was where you know, like my students, as soon as they noticed, like as soon as they wore like a short sleeve shirt or even like something that showed like a little bit of my, my bicep that showed that tattoo, they were all like, oh, like Mrs. Padrone has a tattoo. And I was like, well, yeah, like I'm more, but like, yes, we can talk about this one. <laughs> like this is, you know, and I got it on behalf of like, you know, my my energy being like a mama bear, like it's a bear tattoo is for me. And that sparked like a whole like half sleeve of tattoos connecting to like myself and my relationship with my immediate family, like my husband, my son and myself. And, um, and you know, they just wanted to know about it. It was like a three minute conversation where I'd say, this is what it is. This is why I got it. And then they would, we would all move on, carry on living our lives. Right. But I remember the co-teacher that I had at the time when he like saw that I got it done. He's like, are you like, what are you going to do if the kids ask about it? It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to tell them like, it's not an offensive tattoo. It's, you know, we're going to talk about it and we're going to move on. Cause that's, they're like, they're little people. Like they're not, it's nothing inappropriate. It's nothing like offensive. They just want to know they're curious. Why not answer their questions? But anyway, long tattoo tangent aside. But that definitely sparked so much more within me as well in terms of my own self-expression and coming into my own identity that just like, it like cracked me open and really allowed Mm. me to continue to ask myself the questions of like, what do I want? Which then was able to lead me to leaving teaching and starting my own business and becoming a personal stylist and be able to facilitate these questions and conversations for other people. and. Some people have never even thought about it or they haven't asked themselves since they were a kid, you know, like, who am I outside of the roles that I have in my life? Like, that's a big part of it because most of the people that I come into contact with, you know, who are signing on to be a new client, you know, I ask them and they usually bring up like their job title or the fact that they're a parent or, you know, all a caretaker, all these other aspects. And I'm like, no, no, no all that aside, like strip that all away. (laughs) And who are you or how would someone like, how would someone closest to you describe you if you weren't in the room? Mm. Because sometimes people just get so anxious that they can't even answer. So that's why I'm like, all right, well, like your best friend or, you know, like your partner, how would they describe you if you weren't around? And sometimes that separation allows them to kind of connect with it. And that's when I know like, okay, well, we have, we have some deeper work that we have to do and a little bit more handholding along the way, you know, which is fine. Yeah. It's just, it's all part of the process. Yeah. And it's meeting people where they're at. And I think a lot of people don't always make that connection. They're like, no, I thought I was going to hire somebody to shop for me. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> like, I feel like I'm talking to my yeah. therapist right now. What's happening? I don't like it. And I'm like, well, you reached out to me. So here we go. Buckle up. Love you. <laughs> well, I think it's great. I, and I feel like it's funny too, because, um, you know, you'd made the comment about having just a really great stylist, uh, like hairstylist who understands you and like kind of knows 
what you're looking for, or, or you can at least like guide and, and give um, a sense of, you know, how you want to move forward with what you're doing. And I have joked around that I feel like my friend, my close friends are always the people who have cut my hair, um, you know, for probably the past 20 years at this point. And so having that connection with somebody who, who helps you, you know, understand your look um, you know, we do it so easily with our hair because our hair grows, our hair naturally evolves. And therefore we're like, I don't like what it's doing right now. I want something different, or this doesn't feel like me anymore. I want something different. And it's so easy to do with your hair because it's part of you. Right. Whereas yeah. our clothing is sort of the extension of ourselves and, and it feels like it takes more effort to figure out what that extension of yourself is. Because you have to be more intentional about the things that you're choosing. My hair is going to grow the way my hair is going to grow. I can have somebody cut it to make it look a certain way and then I can style it or do whatever. But there's only so much that you can kind of do with that. And then you can change it and you can swap it. And we feel comfortable with that. We, as a society, have become very comfortable with like, you cut your hair, you change your hair, you dye your hair, you do whatever with it, right? You style it different, right. great. But with clothing, it's like, because the way that clothing is, I'm having this like sort of realization and I'm interested in going down this path with you for a sec is yeah. hairstyles are definitely like there's trendiness, you know, things are of the time frosted tips, thank God faded out. But like, <laughs> you know, we, we've all had our moments and, yeah. but when it comes to clothing, something that's also really deeply personal, like you are basically limited to what's in a store at a given time. Like what is available to you, assuming you're not making your own clothes, right? Sure. So you're trying to find something, you're, you're swimming in a sea of options. And what if none of those options are right for you was sort of like what we were mm -hmm. talking about when, when you asked me the question for myself. Yeah. I feel like we're almost compelled to choose something that doesn't fit our vibe. If, those are the only options. I can understand where you're coming from and why you would say that. For me, I'm like, oh, well, there's always options. <laughs> but that's because it's my job. It's my job to make sure that there are options, right? Like if, if it wasn't my job, I'd be like, you're right. It's sometimes clothes just don't exist. Yeah. Like at the end, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, but what I want to say about that is you're correct, but also not at the same time. And I'm going to explain like how, yes, if you're going to the stores that are readily available to you, you know, you're limiting, you're kind of limiting yourself to what's in your proximity right? Like, you know, in terms of a mall or just stores around you, yes, your options are going to be limited to what's available there. But what I challenge you to do is kind of expand it a little bit beyond and also think about things like shopping secondhand, shop like thrifting, but it does take a lot of effort, you know, sometimes like, especially when you first start, you have to kind of know, have some general idea of what you like what you're looking for and then where to find it. Mm -hmm. And that's where it can be a bit of a daunting task. Um, the other aspect of this conversation that I want to bring up too is having a great tailor to do alterations in like, you know, having somebody that can do alterations is a game changer because sometimes it is about finding a piece that is like so close, like so very close to being that perfect thing, you know, and it's okay if it, if the pants are just a little bit long or like if it's gaping a little bit in the back, like when you find the right tailor and they just, you know, they can make those little alterations, you feel like your whole world has changed. And I mean, coming from somebody who is only five foot two, <laughs> um, I struggle with finding things that are, you know, the appropriate length for someone of my size. And, um, it's, yeah. if I were to just give up because I couldn't find things that fit me perfectly, like off the rack, then I'd have a lot fewer clothes. <laughs> but so I want to say like trying and even like when you're searching and shopping online too, like instead of just sticking with the brands and the clothing stores that you're comfortable with, 
trying to expand and think about the keywords that you want to search for, you know, because you might say like, oh, well, I haven't come across it. It doesn't exist. You know, that is the end of that story for whatever it is that you're trying to find. But how do you know? you know, unless you like really do the searching and then you might find a brand that's only online or a designer that like specifically creates clothes for, you know, the more androgynous look for someone who, you know, is in a feminine body, but also likes more of a masculine style, like, or just being able to flow back and forth. And then you're, again, your world might totally change. So I understand the struggle, but it should not be the end of your story. (laughs) There are options. Yes, exactly. There are options. And, you know, I've definitely, it's not for lack of searching. I can tell you that. Um, The the question is, um, I think it's definitely harder online when you're like trying to figure out what, what you're, what feels right. Mm. Um, And you can, you know, obviously there's the trial and error, get it, return it, whatever. But, um, you know, I think that you make a really interesting point too, though. Um, I think part of what my wife really likes about thrifting is like, it gives sort of visibility into things that might not be like trending at the moment, but like just something that you can find that's more comfortable and and more your fit, more your vibe overall. And she's like definitely found some outfits that feel like she's more comfortable in them. And um, so I admire that and I appreciate like the openness to being like, well, what could work and how do I do this? I think my question for me, and this is like separate of our conversation and just the introspection that I have to do is like, what do I feel like? What are the components of what I'm wearing that are going to make me feel like the most confident or what kind of fits am I looking for that are going to make me feel better, um, you know, in what I'm wearing? And she had also said to me, like, I think you just need to get it a good tailor. So um, you're you're reinforcing <laughs> something that we've discussed. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Always happy to help. I, I tell people all the time, like, I'm here to either support your spouse or you can use me and throw me under the bus when it comes to conversations with your spouse. So either way, yeah. happy to help. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. Well, and and the other thing too, and I'm I'm going to bring it back actually. Um I'm going to veer um off for a second into something that you'd said earlier that I wanted to address because I think this is um related to like you finding sort of yourself in this space and and realizing that this is what you really wanted to do is um I found it really interesting that you said you identified growing up like you always felt like really shy and whether that yeah. was kind of reinforced or Um, you, you, um, internalize that. And then that sort of reflected in how you felt you were. I think that, you know, we talked about you being in band and I feel like what's interesting is I feel like a lot of the people, if I look back on my like middle school, high school years, the people who were like pretty quiet and shy were a lot of the band people, which is interesting. Mm. And I think like, you know, Mm. we were saying at the start of our conversation, music is, a really important form of expression, whether we're the people playing the music or the people, you know, embracing the music in whatever way we can. Did you feel confident when you were younger in the environment that you were in when you were when you were playing music? Like, was that sort of an alternative way for you to express yourself as someone who was shy? 100%. Yes, absolutely. I worked so hard. So I was a flute player. And, um, so flute was my main instrument, like even going through college. And it was something that I knew that I could control, you know, that I was the one like responsible for, you know, in terms of how I could progress and my progression was completely up to me, but also I I loved using it as a form of self-expression, you know, where I didn't always feel comfortable using my voice. Mm. I felt comfortable playing in front of people. And, um, it was something to, you know, playing in band in school growing up, like also that, you know, going through with auditions, you know, I would get anxious about auditions because it's normal, but it was something that I'm just yeah. like, well, it's just part of it. Here we go. Like, I'm going to practice as much as I can. I'm going to work on this and then I'm going to go through with the audition. And it's funny because, um, I remember when I was in college, I performed in the vagina monologues and it was while I was a a music education major and I had seen the performance like once before and I knew I was like, I need to be part of this. And so I auditioned and, you know, got in and it was amazing. 
And it was the same stage that I'd performed on so many times, you know, whether it was as a soloist or with, you know, different ensembles, but being on stage and like even just performing a monologue, even though it wasn't, you know, something I had written, it was a monologue in the play, I still felt exposed in a totally different way that I never really felt when I was performing, you know, with my flute or with mm. band. Um, but that was another moment where I was like, yeah, okay, no, like I can let people see me and um, not hide, feel like I'm hiding behind anything. Yeah, that's really beautiful. I, and I really appreciate you sharing that because I feel like there's, it, it's funny to meet people in adulthood and to see a sign of them, what you're describing, how you felt, it sounds like for a, a decent portion of your life is not what I'm witnessing now. And yeah. it's a testament to that evolution, right? Um, you know, I, I think about how much I've come into my own sense of self, my own confidence, the way that I show up in the world and how I always felt uncomfortable growing up. Like I wasn't out yet. Um, I felt like a lot of what I did was what you quote should do, which I know is a big thing for you too. Right. And yeah. so many of us, it's not unique. And sure. we get trapped in this idea of what we feel everyone expects from us. And we sort of turn that into what we expect of ourselves. And yes. I think part of the reason why, at least at speaking for myself, like the lack of confidence was that I didn't know who I was, but I also didn't necessarily feel safe to fully express who I was. And it wasn't yeah. necessarily that like other people were saying it wasn't safe, but it was definitely the time. I mean, you and I are, are the same age, right? So like I, 20 years ago coming out, it was like a very different thing. I wasn't going down that path, but right. it was also having this sense of freedom to express yourself really shifts how you present to the world to other people. Like I had had one of my close friends from college say to me, like, you, you're so different now. You feel like really enlightened. And I'm like, because I've done a lot of work and I know who I am and I'm choosing to be different than I was. And it's not inauthentic. In fact, it's more authentic. It's like, I'm letting go yes. of the like need to be something and allowing myself to be. Yeah, for sure. It's like, it's giving yourself permission. It's taking off the mask, you know, whatever kind of analogy you yeah. relate to. It's definitely something that I feel like a lot of us are finally really able to do. And it's just, it's fascinating to me to see that. And I love how so many people that I've met in like this phase of my life, since I've become a personal stylist, you know, when they ask me about what I was like as a, a teenager or, you know, in school or even in college and just that comparison. And of course, we're all ex like, we all grow, obviously, like you were not even the same people that we were five years ago, let alone 20. Right. But it's right. still something that, yeah. you know, some of us, I think, have more of a dramatic, oh, well, dramatic is not the right word, but like more of an intense ownership mm. of ourselves now than we, you know, comparing it yeah. to who we were then. And I, I know for me, like a lot of that also came with, you know, part, big part of that was having my business and, you know, trying to make sure that I was being authentic in what I was helping people go through and also making sure that it aligned with myself, but also with becoming a mom and, having a son and wanting to make sure that he knew his mom in a multifaceted way. And for me, you know, I am, I'm queer, but I'm married to a man. So like, you know, just looking at us, it's a very like heteronormative marriage. And I could have just left it at that. Could have been like, yep, nope. We are I'm married to a man, the end. But for me, my queerness is very important to me and my identity. And my son knows I'm queer. He knows that I'm bi. And I find that it's important for him to know that so that he doesn't grow up looking at people as just, you know, like single 
faceted, like the, whatever the opposite of multifaceted is like one dimensional yeah. rather like individuals that people can be multidimensional and multifaceted and that just other options exist beyond what, you know, how we were raised or yeah. how we grew up and what we perceived. Mm, I love that. I really appreciate you sharing that. I feel like that's so important to note, um, I think that, you know, for every person, like you have to do what's right for you in those of situations. Course. I admire your willingness and desire to be transparent with your son about being queer, because I think, you know, I was having a conversation with my friends um, when I was away with them a few weeks ago. And I was, you know, one of my friends had made a comment about bisexuality and, um, it was uninformed. As it usually is. <laughs> I did my best to respond without, you know, sort of condemning for not knowing, but kind of making the point that when you have children, their first like basis of knowledge is what you share with them, right? Right. That sort of responsibility in whatever way. And like, she's she doesn't have a problem with queer people. Like she's one of my closest yeah. friends, you know, she, her, her, um, niece is, is a lesbian as well. And it's like, so it's not about that. It's just that like, you don't live in this world where like you think about that stuff. And so yeah. it's easy to sort of say the thing that maybe isn't accurate or is maybe not necessarily the way that like you, and I don't want to, I'm gonna be like, should think about it, but it is sort of the way, think about it more objectively. And, yeah. you know, when we're in these situations, I think that there is this responsibility to help people better understand um, and do it in a way that is gentle and loving and kind because for you to show up fully, and I love that you said it, you're right, for me to show up fully, you know, and be the best mom and the best wife, but the best me, because the best you for you is going to give the other people in your life the best you for them. And exactly. that's like as simplified as it sounds it's like it's so true and we just have to give ourselves the choice to be as transparent as you're choosing to be in this scenario related to queerness or just related to who you are as a person and what you care about in life and what you value yeah for sure yeah and that's something that i think i don't know like as as a parent or just in relationships that we have you know beyond parenting like it's People only know what you share with them and then how they process that information and how they like receive that is, you know, that's up to them. But I know that there's, you know, when my son has questions, like we were talking about with the Google al algorithms earlier, you know, like I'll, I'll if I don't know the answer, I'm going to look it up and I'm going to confuse my Google algorithm. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but it's important <laughs> for me for, you know, for my son to know more about the world or as much as I can share about the world than, you know, to the extent of my knowledge so that he grows up to be a, a loving, inclusive person. Like that's my goal for him. Yeah. And I think the other piece of it too, is like giving him a sense of safety in whatever yes. form of self-expression might be right to him. And th Absolutely. whether that's you know, identity in terms of gender, sexuality, what have you, or what he wants to wear, what, you know, he wants to learn or do with his life. Like there's, I think that's, you know, speaking to the whole idea of like building the foundation, it's like you showing up with that level of honesty and integrity for yourself is modeling that to your child. And I feel like there's this especially like our generation, I think, you know, raised by um, boomers, it was very much like, what do other people think? Nicole and I talk about this all the time. Mm -hmm. It's like the whole keeping up with the Joneses mentality. Like it doesn't need to be that way. Like we have so much more visibility into what the world offers and how there is such an extensive amount of creativity and expression and option that we can select from or we can dive into and try to identify more with ourselves through the ways that we see other people living and exploring those things. Whereas I feel like their generation was sort of like that. This is the path that you go on. This is how you get the result that you want. And then this is what happens. The problem with that plan is that they kind of fucked it up. And then mm -hmm. we're like, that plan doesn't work anymore anyway. <laughs> so like, 
You got to rethink the whole thing. We're at a time where the openness to the expression is valued more than ever. Yeah, absolutely. And I've (laughs) I've had to unpack a lot with clients, especially clients who are older, who have this very fixated perspective on what is expected of them in terms of what clothes they can or can't wear because of their age, because of their Mm. size, because of the roles that they play in their lives, like whatever it is, like there's always like something or a handful of some things where they're like, oh, I could never wear that. Or, oh my gosh, I love what you have on, but I can never wear that. I'm like, okay, well, let's back it up for a second. Are you saying that because it's not your style aesthetic, which is fine. Like, you know, I don't love everything. <laughs> like, I, you know, I appreciate and respect all kinds of styles and clothing. That's why I do what I do. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to want to put them on my body. So is it that it's not your style aesthetic? Right. Is it that you feel like you have to be of a certain size in order to feel worthy of wearing certain clothes? Is it that you feel like your options become so much more limited because you feel like you're at a certain age that your expectations of how much skin you're showing, you know, can change. And then we talk about like what it would feel like if, you know, they kind of just expanded that comfort zone a little bit or just kind of experimented with things that do interest them. If they're like, oh my gosh, I love what like my girlfriend wears. Like every time I see her, every time I go out to dinner, she always looks so good. And like, okay, well, what is it about her outfits that you like? Like, talk to me about that. Explain that to me. And then we kind of pinpoint it. You know, sometimes it's just the confidence that that person is exuding. Like we were talking about earlier, you know, like that person knows they look good and they're radiating that beam of light and they're just like, yeah, I look good. And people are picking up on that. And sometimes it's more specific to what they're actually wearing. And it does come back down to the clothes. And it's like, okay, well, what would it feel like for you to wear that? And sometimes they're like, oh, well, I I could never. Mm. And then again, like we have to unpack that further. Like, okay, well, what, why? (laughs) Why do you feel like that doesn't apply to you? And it almost always comes back yeah. to a like a, a feeling of a lack, whether it's a lack in self-worth or insecurities that are coming through with their bodies or with their personalities. And we really like go through all of it. And I try to help them to expand that and expand their own beliefs about themselves and what they're capable of through trying on clothes. And if you're of an older generation, you know, especially boomers are like very much like tunnel vision. This is my path. I'm sticking to it. I don't like it, but I'm on it. And this is the path I will be on until the (laughs) end of my days. Like whether it's my job that I chose or the marriage that I'm in, like I am committed, you know? And it's like, okay, well, what if you just turned your head a little bit? And like looked at that little offshoot of your path. Like, did you ever see that before? <laughs> what if we like took a few steps down that path? What would that feel like? And uh, some people just don't even allow themselves. They just have the blinders on. They're like, nope, hate this for me, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Susan. Um, I What an absolutely wonderful, fun, engaging conversation. Thank you. When you said like, this is like, I, this is a path I'm on. I don't like it, but I'm on it. It's like, mm-hmm. man, if there were a motto for a generation, like I just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh God, it's like, I can't. Um, I, It's so, so funny and true. I, I, you know, I see, I really appreciate it when I witness like my dad, since my mom passed, I've witnessed my dad have to get really uncomfortable and mm-hmm. have to give him insight to help him start to like peer over there, look at that path a little bit. It's not yeah. easy, not always effective, but I do sure. think that, you know, one of the benefits of having children who are um, millennials uh, is that <laughs> we we want to explore the other options. And I think yes. 
what I've witnessed for him being able to say like, this is what works for me and knowing that you and I can be similar in certain ways, maybe, maybe consider this. And so yeah. when you speak to like, well, what is that person doing or wearing, um, you know, that's, that's allowing them to exude that feeling that you wish you had, because it really ultimately comes down to the feeling that you want to have. Oh, yeah. um, so what looks supports that feeling that you want to have, what looks supports the confidence that you want to have, that you desire or that you have within you, but you feel is not fully expressed. And mm -hmm. it's really beautiful to see how it, it is a reflection of also like the people that we keep in our lives, the energy that we bring into our lives and the intention that we have of actually like making the change. And I feel like that's what really brings together what you're doing. And I feel like we, we tapped into such a small portion of what you do, um, in terms of the work itself. But what I really love is knowing that because of who you are as a person, so you're a stylist and this is, you know, the job that you have and the work that you do, but the way that you do it is at, um, a deeply personal and emotional and vulnerable level, which is when you said people are like, well, th this isn't therapy. And it's like, isn't it kind of though, you know, because right. the, the point is, is that you're asking yourself the right questions. And I love that you aren't just there to say like, these are the clothes that you should wear. You're asking people, who are you and what is it that would make you feel like the best version of yourself? And to me, that's like the absolute ideal way that you should be approaching something like style. Thank you. I appreciate everything that, that you said. I feel really seen and heard by you. And that means a lot. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, likewise. I, it, I feel like, um, there's, it, it really surprised me when you said that, um, you, you were shy growing up because I feel like you are, are very easy to talk to. You come with a, 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 a presence that is strong, but, um, but gentle. And that's something that I don't think a lot of people have a great understanding of what that balance looks like. And so you stepping into your most authentic version of you showing up the way that you do is very warm, welcoming and inspiring. And I'm just so grateful that we've had the chance to chat. Thank you. Me too. I'm like getting all emotional um, in a good way. <laughs> Thank you for that. I appreciate that so much. Like I said, I really hope that we we can have plenty of other conversations. But in the meantime, um, would you like to share with listeners where they can find you on social or your website or anywhere else that you want to point them? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, the best places to really like get even more of a sense of, <laughs> of me and the work that I do would absolutely be my website, which is susanpadronestylist.com. And Instagram is my, um, my social media outlet of choice. And I'm very active on it. It's me responding to all the messages. So if you, there's something that really resonated with you in the episode, you know, absolutely reach out and let me know. Um, I love receiving those messages and just continuing the conversations. Happy to do it. Yeah, that's amazing. And I just have one more question before we hop off here that just yeah. occurred to me. Are you, do you primarily work with clients that are local or do you work with people who are outside sort of of your general vicinity in case people were interested in um, your services, but they might not live near you? Yeah, I work with clients all over. Um, so I work with clients both virtually and in person. I also travel for clients. So I am all over the place with, <laughs> with how you can work with me. I, in addition to personal styling, I do color analysis too, which I do both virtually and in person. And that's a lot of fun. So if you're not ready, to like fully commit to a personal styling experience, because after listening to this episode, you know, it's not just about getting new clothes and you're like, I don't know, Susan's going to go deep with me and yeah. I might not be ready for that. Color analysis is like the perfect way to just, you know, get to chat with me and get some information about yourself and, you know, explore styling yourself and choosing clothes in a totally different way, but not as deep. <laughs> so would the color analysis be essentially like helping people understand like kind of like what the palettes are that they might like and gravitate more towards? 
Yeah. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's a lot more than, I mean, I'm sure obviously I know a lot of your audience follows you on TikTok. So I'm sure that they've seen a lot of the TikTok filters <laughs> with color analysis. But yeah, when you work with someone who's certified like myself, you know, I go through, I analyze your coloring, your level of contrast and intensity. And we talk about the colors that are best for you. Like there's no such thing as like a bad color, but there are Mm. colors that are going to really highlight your features in the best ways. And that's the the beauty of, of color analysis. And it's great for all skin tones, all people. It's just you know, it's really come a long way since the the late seventies and eighties when it was just the four seasons and uh, that's it. Um, so it's really it's fascinating, and that's become like something that I really enjoy doing too. <laughs> oh, very cool! I um I didn't really even know that was a thing, so I'm happy to have learned that it is, and um it also it really um sparks my interest because I just came back from a little very brief tropical getaway that gave me a really good tan. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. my skin tone is eight shades darker than it was when I left. (laughs) So things look different. And my wife said to me yesterday, she's like, oh, that shirt looks really good on you. I was like, it's because I have a tan and it's a light blue and light blues when I'm tan look awesome. (laughs) Yeah, I believe it. (laughs) Well, Susan, I've had such a blast chatting with you. I appreciate your time. I know we're a little over here. So thank you for spending the extra few minutes with me. And I'm just really looking forward to, you know, continuing this connection and Happy to happy to have realized that we are basically hometown buddies uh, without even having known it. <laughs> I know. I love that. I love that about us. I love all of like the little ways that our paths have crossed without even knowing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Nikki. It's been such a pleasure. Likewise. Gang, that's all for this episode. And we will catch you on the flip side. Gang, thanks so much for joining me for this week's episode. I just appreciate your support and it means so much to me that you tune in week after week. The best thing that you can do to help spread the word about the podcast is if this episode resonated with you, go ahead and share it with somebody else wherever you listen to your podcasts, or you can go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel and share it from there. I also really appreciate it if you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts because that really helps give people a better understanding of what the show's about and what you appreciate about the conversations that we're having. 